What's up, guys and gals, and welcome back to Vrakus's Sweet Embrace for the Dwarves. My name is Splattercat, happy to have you here today, and I'm going to desperately try to untangle my headphones from my person, but this is a cool little RPG, a little tactical RPG that I found, and if you like games like R-Clash Legacy, Total War, things like that, it seems like a really interesting title. Uh-oh. <laughs> How nice to see you again, Lot Yonan. It must have been an age since we last met face to face. Nudin, welcome. Please, sit down. No, thank you, my friend. These are urgent matters, and I don't have much time. You must come to Leos Nudin immediately. The perished land is stirring. Are you sure? What makes you think that? I found out about 60 orbits ago, during a visit to the borders. Our magical barriers have weakened and become porous. The Elfa have left their land, and a huge horde of orcs have marched into Girdelgard. Were you able to strengthen the spell with your magic? No. I can't repair the damage alone. We need the combined power of the Six. The other four are already on their way here, but we need your help, too. I will set off for Parista without delay. Oh, and um, as you're coming, could you also take the opportunity to bring back the things that I lent to you? Of course. I have them already packed in a bag. Oh, thank you. We'll be expecting you. Dude, add some iodine to your diet. Good lord. I know it's hard because it's medieval times, but you gotta get that goiter looked at, bro. Maybe some the little lumps on top of it. I don't know what's up with those. You might want to get yourself on some antibiotics or something. I assume since we have magic, Utterly we might be- blinded by the sunlight, you squeeze your eyes tightly shut after only a few steps. The time spent underground has made you so sensitive to light that you're forced to seek shelter in the shade of a mighty oak. Cool. Me likey. So my map shifted over to here. I guess we're going this way. What is this? Oh, that's actually our objective. So that's 300 miles right there. We've got a bit of a walk in front of us. Oh, you gotta add birds for scale. You always add birds for scale. It's an artist trick. You always add, that's pretty common actually. If you look at any wide, wide scale image that's like of a mountain or something, there's always little birds in there just to give it a little bit of scale. Every time. And you don't notice it till you notice it. And then once you notice it, you start seeing it everywhere. You reach a small lake by a birchwood. Your feet hurt and your eyes still sting in the unaccustomed sunlight. But a smile spreads across your face nonetheless. You've covered a decent distance on the first day of your big journey. You pitch your camp and lie down to sleep on the hard forest floor. When you awake in the morning, your legs are stiff and achy. Trying not to feel sorry for yourself, you throw your rucksack over your shoulder. You're a dwarf, and dwarves don't complain. You're damn right they don't. So we can go left, or we can go right. I'm going left. Around so midday, with the sun high in the sky and the first beads of sweat appearing on your forehead, you see something move next to the road, a few hundred meters ahead. Some crows are pecking at something in the long grass. Maybe sneak up on the crow? I mean, we're not really we're not really good at sneaking as dwarves, so maybe we'll stand still and observe. You survey the grass, the bushes, and the few trees that are growing on both sides of the track. The wind blows through the grass, and the leaves tremble. The pecking of the birds is only interrupted by the occasional fluttering of their wings. Apart from that, you see nothing. I'm gonna sneak. I I'm gonna do something that I know is ill-advised for a dwarf and I'm gonna sneak. The creaking leather armor, the clattering rucksack, and a dwarf's inability to be quiet makes the crows flap around as you move from one bush to another. You give up trying to be stealthy, stand up straight, and see two human bodies in the flattened grass. Uh-oh. Dude, this music is epic as shit. I'm not even gonna lie right now, I'm hyped about this adventure. It's like... It's 
Sorry about that. I had to swap recording software. Fraps does not agree with this game. But other side of, or I'm sorry, other software seem to be doing okay. So we're good. Let's have a look at these bodies, shall we? You look down on a tall, broadly built man. He's wearing dark brown leather armor that is strengthened with iron plates. There's a sword lying next to him. Was he trying to defend himself against something? Or someone? There is no blood on the sword. I love how there's a little picture. They actually drew a dead guy and put it into the actual talking right there. Like, they did a good job. What I like about this so far is that it's like a DD and d campaign. Like, you've got the narrator who's talking about the things that are happening, and she's very well voice acted. And in between, you get the characters talking, and as you look at things, she narrates and says what you see, instead of just like a little thing popping up that you have to read. Uh, I really, really like that. A slender man lies in front of you, dressed in an expensive robe. It is in the colors of Turga the Fair-Faced, one of the six Magi. The dead man must be one of Turga's famuli. You don't see any wounds. Can I loot him? By Vrakus. There are some narrow stab wounds in the man's chest. The cuts are too big to have been made by arrows, but too small for sword wounds. Dude got stuck. Let's turn him over. The man has the same incisions. It's clear that both men were killed by the same weapon. But what that weapon might be, you cannot say. I'll tell you what I'm going to say. Let's get the hell out of here. I don't mess with dead bodies on the road, man. I know where this goes. I've played enough RPGs to know exactly what's about to happen. A We're going to... that probably belonged to one of the dead. It seems to have been searched and then thrown away carelessly. You find a few implements, some provisions, and a map. A route is drawn on it from Perista, Nudin's capital, to Lot Yonan's vaults. Does this mean that Turga the Fair-Faced is in Perista and wanted to send Lot Yonan a message? And if so, why didn't he use magic? Did he want to contact him without anyone noticing? Why all this secrecy? So you can't mess around here for too long because somebody's going to come across us and they're going to be like, oh, you've killed these men. And then you're going to be sitting there trying to make bluff checks and nobody's going to believe you and you're going to have bad dice for the day. You scour the area once more and ask yourself what to do next. I suppose we can stay and look for further clues, although I don't really see anything. Like, we already took a look at all the dead bodies as far as I know, so there's two dead guys. There's a bush over here. Hmm. Nothing. So maybe the game seems to be implying they were attacked from the brush, possibly? I mean, they've got the stab wounds or whatever. How far off the road can I go? It obviously doesn't want me to leave. Like, I thought I had gotten everything, but we got some extra provisions. Do we pick up anything? Like, do we have an inventory? So we've got that, we've got provisions, we've got magical artifacts, we've got a Frala scarf, or Frala scarf. No, we can continue. I don't really see anything, though. There's no key to hold down, I don't think, that will show you everything that's, like, context-sensitive. Oh, there's another bush over here. Nothing again. You halt. There is something. Another rucksack. You open the rucksack and recognize that someone has already rummaged through it. As well as some implements and writing utensils, you find a pouch full of gold and a talisman. The gold is proof that this is not a case of robbery. I'll take the talisman? Warmth and a feeling of security flush through your body as you touch the talisman. You feel safer just holding it in your hand. I'm taking you with me. Taking the gold, too. It seems like a waste not to do so. So there was something inside of there. If we go to our inventory, what do we have now? When damage is received, there is a 50% chance of reducing it by 50%. Oh, and I can equip it. Cool. Alright, sweet. Does it add to my character or anything like that? Like, does he have a talisman on now? No. Ah, Bummer. I was hoping he would have a talisman on now. Ah, oh, well. Basically, all of these bushes with the pink flowers are suspect for now. 
Got to watch out. So there's a second one over there. I don't see anything along this side. I suppose we can, like, bury the bodies and leave. I don't see anything else that I'm mousing over here. Yeah, so far, nothing. I guess we'll be on our way. You scour the area. We'll bury the dead and continue. We got ourselves a talisman, so that's pretty sweet. So we know that there were messengers that were bound for Lot Eonan and they were murdered it's on the way. Consuming and strenuous work digging shallow graves in the ground with a stick and covering the corpses with a few stones. But it should at least keep the crows from their feasting for a while. You continue on your way so as to put a few more miles between you and your grisly find before night falls. How do we know what time it is? So we have 20 supplies. Oh, look at that. Things move around. So I guess every single one of these that I go through ends one day. What is this? Oh, I'm on day seven of my journey. What's up with this caravan? That's Oh, it's a dwarf merchant. Cool. I'm going to go to the town. As the gable end of a small farmhouse and a barn appear from behind a hilltop, you hear the loud cries of children at play. A girl runs along the path laughing followed by a small boy with a big stick in his hand. The boy is trying to catch up his sister with a determined look on his face, but is finding it difficult to keep his short legs under control on the uneven path. Let's see. I suppose we will stay and watch what happens. The boy trips and falls to the ground with a bump. Before the girl can reach him to help, he picks himself up and grabs the stick to continue the chase. In doing so, he catches a glimpse of you and his eyes grow wide. All he manages to say is, there, as he points towards you with a chubby little finger. Now the girl has turned to face you too. Before you can say a word, she lifts her little brother up into her arms and runs screaming towards the farmhouse. We can go up to the farm. Well, I mean, there's no reason for us to go up to the farm, though, is there? Give it a wide berth Don't and continue. Don't wish to scare the children further, so you continue on your journey. As I say, it doesn't seem like there's really a point, is there? You see a flickering light through the trees some way from the path. It might come from a campfire. Let's approach audibly so we don't scare anybody. You walk towards the fire with confident strides until you finally make out three broad-shouldered men with axes. Two rabbits are sizzling over the fire. The men are joking with one another, but you can only understand the odd word. They haven't noticed you yet. Once you reach the edge of the firelight, you say amicably, Greetings. My name is... The men jump up and grab their axes. Who's there? Well, I'll be. Is that a groundling? The men look you over suspiciously. Um. My name is Tongdil. I'm only a traveler who would have nothing against a warm fire and some company. <laughs> <laughs> A groundling wants our company. <laughs> we are honest, hard-working men. Why would we have anything to do with groundlings? Be off with you. The man strengthens his grip on the axe and passes his tongue over his yellow teeth while keeping you in his sights. Okay. You shrug your shoulders indifferently and take three small steps backwards without taking your eyes off the men. All right, if I'm not welcome here, then I'll go. Good. And don't even think about coming back to stab us in the back or steal from us. We'll keep guard. There's nothing here for grandling scum. Man. Your heart is pounding and you confront the man a little more courageously than you feel. I'm no thief, and I'm certainly no murderer. I only wanted to see if... Pah! 
All groundlings are thieves and good for nothings. You find it difficult to take control of your voice again. Have you met many dwarves? Enough to know that you're all dirty thieves. To be fair, I did try to steal food off people's plates. I mean, I'm not, and I just looted a bunch of backpacks that I found on the side of the road that were definitely not mine too. So, so far, the evidence is not lining up well for my court date. Now consider this, I am a dwarf with an axe, and I don't use my axe for cutting down trees. The men are visibly unsettled and lower their axes a little. I thought so. You turn your back on the men and walk back to the path confidently. You don't hear any steps behind you, and only once you've put distance between you do you dare look back over your shoulder. None of the men have followed you. You sigh with relief. It could have ended up a very painful experience if you'd provoked the men or shown them any weakness. Hell no, we don't back down. We're a dwarf. We look them right in their eye and we say, listen, anti-dwarf racists, you guys can be dicks, but I'm not going to play your game. And I'm not going to walk away either. I'm going to sit here proud and strong, my shoulders cocked, ready. And if you want to go, let's go. And if you don't want to go, then we'll part ways. So where am I headed now? Like, can I go into the city? Is that possible? I guess not. Axeldale. It looks like there's only a couple places where I can cross the river, namely right there, so I guess I'll make my way in that direction. The banks of the water and can see Axeldale on the other side, but there isn't a bridge for far and wide. The fishermen's boats glide over the water, which sparkles in the sun. None of the men seem to notice you while they throw out their nets. Um, continue. You leave the peaceful banks of the river behind you and continue on your way. You look down on a large... Oh, shit. I was an accident. I was trying to pan the camera. You look down on a large village on the banks of the Werda. Some of the village is built on stilts in the river. A wooden bridge spans the fast-flowing water. A huge wooden palisade has been erected to protect the village from attack. Okay. Follow the path to the gate? The guards on the palisade are watching you. Their armor looks well cared for and well made. The smith who made them knew what he was doing. You conclude that the men depend on the protection the armor offers and aren't just wearing them to look good. They're certainly not villagers. Oh, cool. We actually get to go into a city now. This will be fun. Dun, 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 dun. Music's so epic. All I'm doing is walking down a road right now. But it's like when you go out for a jog or you're like working out and you got that really epic music on. You're like pushing yourself like, Ugh! you start walking to the rhythm in between machines. If you're at the gym or if you're just out on the street, you're like, yeah. Foot falls at the same time as the beat because you're feeling it. Feeling it. So they got pyres out here. There are small fires burning every 50 steps or so. They are intended to light up the area in front of the palisade in the night, so that orcs can't creep up to within an arrow's reach without being seen. So orcs are like a real problem out here. They're like an issue for which there is no tissue. Gotcha. The double gate is made of strong planks. Sturdy, but still much less solid than the fixed parts of the palisade. Security has been forgone here for practical reasons. Never a good idea when building fortifications. Can I go in? Some of the guards begin to whisper as you near the gate. Hello up there! What brings you to fair good water? And have you seen any orcs on your travels, Groundling? The man leaning over the palisade eyes you up and down carefully. Um. Good water is well known for its hospitality. A fact that you've just made up yourself. Let me in and I will tell other travellers all about it. I regret to inform you that we cannot allow you to enter. The gates stay closed once night has fallen. There is certainly no regret showing in the man's face. Mm, I can give him 20 gold. Gate doesn't make a very stable impression. I could look about, I can know these things, okay. Got some interesting decorations up there. Let me see if I can offer to fix the gate. I'm a blacksmith. And a dwarf. 
Let me tell you, your gate might look solid, but it won't withstand a real orc assault. The murmuring all around him makes the man pause for a moment. If anyone else had criticized the stronghold, they'd have been laughed down and shooed away. But no one understands defense systems like the dwarves. A dwarf blacksmith who just happens to be standing in front of our gate? I like how that guy's got that look on his face like who farted. Somebody in the lecture hall definitely farted. I'm going to figure out who it was. You stunk me out, and now I'm going to figure it out. Mm. Keep lying. It'll work out. That's right. I can see to it that orcs crack open their skulls on your gate, just like at home on the high pass. Skulls that add up to hard cash for you. You only know about the second link stronghold from books, but you can see in the man's face you've pushed the right buttons. All right then. You can spend the night in the village. You begin work tomorrow morning, and it a better work like you promised. Of course. It's a trifle. Like hell it is. We're sneaking out of town the second the sun comes up. We're going to be up and out of here. After a meal, you spend the night in the comfort and shelter of a good water tavern. The next morning, you feel fully refreshed. You strengthen the gate with cross braces of wood and iron using your experience and skill. Now it should be able to withstand an attack for much longer. Mercenaries and villagers alike watch you work, clearly impressed. As you finish, a man approaches you. Well done, dwarf. We were right to bring you into our village. The village grew rich through bridge tolls, and this wealth must be defended. You're proud of what you've achieved in such a short time. You've even invested more time than was wise. I was happy to help, but half the day is lost and I must be on my way. A strong dwarf like you will always be welcome here in Goodwater. Be careful out there. Who knows where the orcs might be lurking. Alright, so we got 50 XP for that too. In my inventory, we need 750 to get to level 2. We start with 1800 health. Man, those sturdy dwarves. An uneasy feeling has been your constant companion since you left Goodwater. Every little sound in the forest makes you fear you've been discovered by a horde of orcs. But you reach the end of the day without bumping into any of the greenskins. It seems as though Vrakus has granted you one more day in Girdelgard. As night begins to fall, you pass a large oak tree and decide to call it a day. Near the oak tree is an abandoned camp with a fireplace, which appears to be a couple of days old. Let's set up camp hidden. You swing yourself up the trunk and then pull up your baggage after you. You're prepared to sleep in a tree like a bird if it means escaping the orc's attentions. You sling your rope twice around your stomach and the trunk of the tree to stop you from falling accidentally. You close your eyes and dream. You see North Pass and smell the fresh icy wind that sweeps over the peaks of Great Blade and Dragon's Tongue. But the harmony is interrupted by the hideous roar of an unending flood of orcs throwing itself unceasingly against the fortification. You smell the disgusting green blood of the orcs and taste the rancid fat of their armor on your tongue. The bitter taste becomes stronger until it's unbearable and wrenches you out of your dream. You open your eyes and are surprised at the brightness as a glance at the sky confirms that it's still night. Your eyes move towards the ground, and what you see makes the blood in your veins freeze. No, it's orcas. There's so many shamus creeping up on us. Sintras of Son Balsur. My master, Nod On the Doublefold, ruler of the perished land, has elected you, the lords of Taboribor, 
to be the sword that conquers the South. You mean, you want us to put our necks on the line and be killed by some magus? Lord Yonan and the others will be taken care of. Your task is to create a diversion in the South until my master's plan succeeds. And which of us is the leader? The one that conquers the most land. So Kragna will be the new Grand Lord. He glares at Ushnots and Bashkug. The Kragna Shore Tribe will conquer the most land. Never! We will overwhelm the cities of the Red Bloods quicker than you can suck the marrow from a bone. We shall see. You can't believe what you're hearing. If the beasts of Teon ride into battle together, catastrophic cycles lie ahead for Girdleguard. True that, yo. True that. Apparently all of those orcs failed their perception check. And I must have had a hell of a stealth roll. It was the worst of your life. You spent every single moment afraid that you'd be found and savaged by the orcs. But as the first rays of sun broke through the treetops, the orcs abandoned their camp and left without discovering you. Mm, let's leave. Damn, that's a thick rope. That's that good shit rope right there. Looks like there's some things right here that like you could look through. I guess I'll pan and scan through the camp, but we'll do that in the next episode. My name is Splattercat. Thank you for joining me here at the Nerd Castle for the next episode of The Dwarves. Where we take this young short beard and lead him through an interesting series of events. There's some armor laying over here. We'll have a look at everything, okay? Bye, everybody.